This is Radio RSA, the voice of South Africa from Johannesburg. A White House report says President Nixon still supports the decision to quell the uprising at Attica Prison, despite the revelation that nine hostages were killed by police bullets. The Daily Graphic has criticized the Mogadishu Declaration passed at a recent Senate meeting of East and Central African leaders. The Daily Graphic says that as a result of the declaration, poor taxpayers in black Africa can expect to see more money being poured into the pockets of pleasure-loving terrorists living outside the borders of South Africa. These taxpayers will be asked to foot the bill for further wild attacks. Mozambican people, in September 1962, the Congress of the Mozambique Liberation Front, FOLIMO, affirmed unanimously the will and determination of the Mozambican people to fight for national independence, for the wealth of our country and the work of the Mozambican people continue to be exploited by the Portuguese colonialists and their imperialist allies. Our people are murdered for participating in the struggle for the liberation of our country. The prisons are full of patriots and those who are still free live in uncertainty of what the next day will bring. Faced with this situation, for Lima is left with no alternative but to conclude that armed struggle is the only way for the Mozambican people to achieve their sacred rights. Mozambican people, workers and peasants, workers on the plantations, in the timber mills and in the concessions, workers in the mines, on the railways, in the harbors and in the factories, intellectuals, civil servants, Mozambican soldiers in the Portuguese army, students, men, women and young people, patriots, in the name of all of you, for him today, on the 25th of September 1964, solemnly proclaims the general armed insurrection of the Mozambican people against Portuguese colonialism for the attainment of the complete independence of Mozambique. The armed struggle which we announce today for the destruction of Portuguese colonialism and of imperialism will allow us to install in our country a new and popular social order. The Mozambican people will thus be making a great historical contribution toward the total liberation of our continent and the progress of Africa and of the world. Independence or death, we shall win. Long live Fralimo, long live Mozambique. Long live Africa! Mozambique, located on the east coast of southern Africa, is about the size of California and borders on Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Along with Angola, Guinea-Bissau, the Cape Verde Islands, Sao Tome and Principe, it is a vestige of the Portuguese colonial empire established from the 16th to the 19th centuries in Africa, Asia, and South America. There are almost eight million people in Mozambique, and over one million of them live in that one-fourth of the countryside liberated by the Mozambique Liberation Front, Frelimo. Portuguese ships first arrived in East Africa and along the coast of what is now Mozambique in the late 15th century. By the 19th century, slavery and the slave trade had become the main commercial activities of Portugal in Africa. However, Portugal had still not been able to conquer the interior and relied upon raiding parties in order to fill its ships with slaves. At the Congress of Berlin, 1884-85, the larger European powers divided Africa and ended Portugal's dream of establishing a unified colony linking Angola to Mozambique. Portugal then set out to conquer the interior areas of the territories assigned to it by the larger imperial powers. It was not until 1918 that Portugal succeeded in conquering the interior of Mozambique and temporarily ended the military resistance, which up to that time was primarily local rather than national. South Africa's stake in Portugal's colonial war lies in the fact that a free and independent Mozambique is critical to the liberation of Zimbabwe and South Africa itself. Zimbabwe is landlocked and the Rhodesian regime depends upon Mozambican ports for an outlet to the sea. 
South Africa utilizes Portuguese control of Mozambique in the following manner. First, as a buffer to protect itself from guerrilla warfare by the South African people. A liberated Mozambique will mean that South Africa's front lines will shift further south. Secondly, most of South Africa's mines are located in the Transvaal, and the shortest and therefore cheapest way of shipping the gold, diamonds, and platinum mined in South Africa to Europe and North America is through Mozambique's natural deep water ports. Thirdly, South Africa has a chronic shortage of labor. Every year, Portugal permits South Africa to press over 200,000 Mozambican men into working in the mines of the Transvaal. Thus, the struggle to free Mozambique is viewed with alarm by the illegal minority regimes in the rest of Southern Africa. They know that a victory in this strategically located country will provide an important psychological boost to the African people in their respective countries. Today, Portugal is the poorest and most backward country in Western Europe. Most of the Portuguese people are exploited peasants living under an openly fascist regime which seeks to export its class contradictions to African colonies. Yet since 1961, Portugal has been fighting to maintain its colonial position in Africa. Without support from the NATO powers, Portugal would not be able to fight one, let alone three, colonial wars. In addition to a steady supply of small arms, jeeps, armored vehicles, airplanes, boats, bombs, napalm, and herbicides, Portugal has been provided with economic aid in order to combat inflation, unemployment, and balance of payments problems at home. In December of 1971, the U.S. presented Portugal with an aid package of $436 million. This aid will ease the burden of continuing these wars, which are costing Portugal over a million dollars a day. The NATO powers are willing to invest in these colonial wars because Portugal is acting as their agent in Southern Africa. A growing number of American corporations have investments in Mozambique and Angola. An even larger number have investments in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa. Portugal, being a neo-colony of the richer capitalist nations, benefits only from what is left over after exploitation of its colonies by its more powerful allies. Mineral concessions, land development schemes, and transportation networks are all dominated by capital from the larger Western powers. A dramatic illustration of the various interests allied against the people of Mozambique is the proposed Caborabasa Dam, financed by an international consortium with backing from U.S., British, French, West German, and South African capital. If built, the dam would be the largest in Africa and the fourth largest in the world. South Africa plans to consume most of the power generated, which would greatly assist that country's economic growth. In addition, Portugal plans to settle one million Europeans in the area around the dam in the hope that these settlers will form a so-called second line of defense against Remimo. So far, over 25,000 Africans have been forcibly removed to make way for this project. The heaviest fighting is now taking place in the province where Portugal hopes to build this dam. The presence of South African and Rhodesian troops, as well as increased aid for Portuguese forces, demonstrate the strategic significance of this project. Because of its economic weaknesses, Portugal has not been flexible and surrendered formal political control of its colonies while attempting to maintain economic control. Portugal knows that it cannot exercise any economic control without formal political control. Therefore, pleas, petitions, and peaceful protests by the Mozambican people were met by increased Portuguese violence. On June 16, 1960, more than 500 unarmed people were murdered after assembling for a peaceful meeting at the town of Mueda. In 1962, Frei Limo was organized by the merger of three separate nationalist organizations. In the course of the struggle, Frei Limo has become more than just a front. 
It is a military and political institution. But it is also an educational institution, an agricultural institution, a health institution, and a social services institution. In the course of the armed struggle, Fray Limo has become a revolutionary party of the masses of Mozambicans. Leadership is based upon a concept of responsibility rather than rank. The leaders are called responsables, which in English literally means the responsibles. If one were asked to identify the leadership or policy makers of Filimo, one need merely point to any school teacher, any peasant engaged in agricultural production, or any group of children laughing and playing in the liberated areas. In working for a common goal, people have learned to submerge their own individual egos, and individuals do not assume positions of responsibility with an idea that he or she has inherited a position of prestige or power on an individual basis. Very often, people are reassigned to different jobs and different areas of responsibility, as Filimo strives to put people who are best able to perform in specific jobs. In this revolution, there is no distinction made in the tasks one is called upon to perform strictly because of a person's sex or age. The people of Mozambique are waging a protracted people's war. It is a protracted struggle in that it is comparable to a long-distance relay race rather than a sprint. In this sense, the revolution is a process and not an event. Filimo's main weapons are the people of Mozambique themselves, their unity and their political consciousness. In many of the traditional societies, as in most societies, particularly under colonialism, women were assigned an inferior status. They drew water, gathered wood, and bore children. Men were the warriors and the herders of cattle, jobs to which considerable prestige was attached. Today in the liberated areas of Mozambique, the Frelimo guerrilla army sets an example of mobilization and effective utilization of all components. No job is performed only by men or only by women. Men and women engage in various aspects of military activities. Men and women serve as teachers and medical cadre. Men and women cook, sew, and perform other housekeeping chores. Naturally, these changes did not occur overnight, and the process of change in the status of women is continuing. In 1967, the first group of women began full-scale political and military training in order to make them more capable of fulfilling whatever tasks the revolution might require. In some areas, the people were literally amazed to see women in uniforms, carrying weapons, and functioning as part of a disciplined command structure. The people of Mozambique are the first to say that they still have a way to go in changing the status of women, just as they have a long way to go in all other aspects of the struggle. However, revolution must be viewed as a dynamic process with constant change, just as a long-distance relay team gets stronger and stronger each day of application, and just as the seeds of a mango tree undergo a change from seeds to tree, getting stronger and more firmly rooted in the process, so too grows the revolution in Mozambique and all of its changes and dynamics.
Today, in the liberated areas of Mozambique, young girls are attending school in large numbers for the very first time. The life which they grow into will be very different from that which older women grew into. One of Frelimo's first priorities has been education. The first president of Frelimo, Eduardo Munlan, who was assassinated by Portuguese agents in 1969, had this to say about education. We have always attached such great importance to education because, in the first place, it is essential for the development of our struggle since the involvement and support of the population increase as the understanding of the situation grows. In the second place, a future independent Mozambique will be in very grave need of educated citizens to lead the way in development. In the liberated areas, primary or elementary schools were established with very basic materials. Where classrooms exist, they are built by the students and teachers themselves out of the materials found in the forest or bush. For the first time, students are being taught very basic skills, how to read and write, how to add and subtract, something about themselves and their country. They learn about Africa, its past, its present, and its future. Every day in their lives, the future of Mozambique and the rest of Africa is being shaped. In their lives, education is not a way for them to achieve upward mobility or isolate themselves as an intellectual elite, nor is it a meaningless abstraction which leads to dependence upon external economic conditions. Instead, they are learning these basic skills so that they can teach others of their people the same skills. Plus, in their daily lives, they know the importance of being able to count the number of soldiers, planes, and bombs that the enemy uses. Even though there are no expensive school buildings or other such facilities, the work of education goes forward, as the most important components of any school are students willing to learn, teachers willing to teach, and a common motivation to achieve a common goal or objective. The students and teachers work together in this respect. When school is out, the teachers do not go one way into cars for a trip home to exclusive suburbs, while the students go another way, deeper into a ghetto. Instead, they are all part of the same mass movement, and the teachers live, work, and struggle in the bush with all of the people. You will never hear of teachers from Frelimo striking because they have been asked to perform so-called non-professional duties. You will never hear of teachers from Frelimo striking over issues which affect only their own economic interests at the expense of the community. You will never hear of students or teachers being disrespectful of each other or assaulting each other. No one is a specialist, and in the course of the struggle, everyone is called upon to perform many tasks. Under Portuguese colonialism, health services were concentrated in the towns and urban areas. The majority of the peasant population never had access to doctors, nurses, hospitals, or clinics. The colonial land and labor policies caused chronic malnutrition and reduced resistance to disease. Tropical diseases such as malaria, bilharzia, yaws, and sleeping sickness are common in the country as well as infectious diseases such as smallpox, yellow fever, and typhoid. Frelimo has established health centers in the liberated areas which provide medical services to the people living there for the first time. At the present time, 
no Mozambican doctors would have returned to work inside the country. However, Frelimo has been able to meet this challenge with something more important than a degree. Medically trained cadres who are members of the guerrilla army administer to the health needs of the people. Although they cannot perform complicated surgery and do not have all the tools of modern medicine at their disposal, they do possess the most essential qualities. Dedication, commitment, and compassion. They treat gunshot wounds and napalm burns. They set broken bones. They remove parasites. They show the people ways of improving their diets. And in raising standards of public health, they conduct extensive programs of preventive medicine under which large numbers of the people in the liberated areas receive inoculations against disease. And they provide a sympathetic ear and an understanding voice where there was none before the revolution. Another important priority is the development of agricultural production, which is the source of survival of the people. Any revolution must be able to feed itself. Naturally, there are no supermarkets or grocery stores in the liberated areas of Mozambique. Everyone must be able to live off the land. Under Portuguese colonialism, many of the African people were forced to grow cash crops, such as cotton, or coffee, and as a result, there was often not enough food to feed the population. One of the ways that the revolution has addressed itself to the specific needs of the people is by freeing them from forced cultivation and releasing their energies to concentrate on subsistence farming. Throughout the liberated areas, there is a constant stress on the importance of increasing agricultural production. Frelimo has concentrated on the production of cassava, corn, beans, ground nuts, and other staples. Agricultural cooperatives have been established. And as part of their normal duties, all members of the guerrilla army engage in agricultural production, as do all other sectors of the population. Among the prime targets of the Portuguese army are the fields where the people work and grow food. In a war such as this, where the Frelimo guerrilla army does not have airplanes and the Portuguese control the air, the Portuguese can always temporarily reoccupy a specific portion of the liberated areas. Portugal can concentrate its airplanes, helicopters, artillery, and troops in any given area. For the past two years, the Portuguese soldiers have only been able to enter the liberated areas in helicopters, however. And once the Portuguese soldiers are out of the helicopters and must operate on their own feet in the bush, they are usually able to remain for no longer than a couple of weeks before the guerrilla army drives them out. The pattern which exists in Mozambique is very similar to that which exists in Indochina. During its offensives, the Portuguese army has three objectives. One, to destroy as much of the people's food as possible in an effort to starve them out. Two, to terrorize the local population, to make them feel unsafe and insecure in the liberated areas so that they will feel that Frelimo cannot protect them as the Portuguese attempt to disrupt their normal lives. Three, to destroy as many of the institutions of national reconstruction as possible. This means that all schools and clinics and hospitals, all nurseries in the liberated areas, are military targets. Every man, woman, and child, and every leaf on a tree that breathes is a military target. Due to the nature of the war that they are fighting, the Portuguese soldiers feel that if they destroy a hut, they have destroyed a school, hospital, or a clinic. If they destroy five or six huts, they feel that they have destroyed a base or a village. What they are incapable of understanding is that these institutions all exist in the hearts and minds of the people, in their spirit and their determination to resist. The institutions are in fact the people themselves and not the structures that house the institutions temporarily. So when these attacks are launched, everything is moved out of the huts and into the bush. 
every pencil, every piece of paper, every blackboard, every bottle of medicine, every bandage is moved out of the huts where temporarily housed, and the schools continue under trees in the bush. The nurseries continue under trees in the bush. Food, which has been hidden for purposes such as this, is brought out and prepared. In every single dimension, the struggle continues, even during full-scale offensives and terror tactics used by the Portuguese army. A luta continua, which means the struggle continues, are the words with which Eduardo Monlani, Frelimo's first president, used to end his letters. Inside the liberated areas of Mozambique, these words take on important meaning as the concept of continuing the struggle, no matter what obstacles are faced, springs to life. The revolution in Mozambique is not made only with guns. Weapons are important components of the struggle, but without weapons, the people would not have been able to drive the Portuguese soldiers away and establish liberated areas in which they could begin the job of national reconstruction. However, the people of Mozambique place their weapons in the proper perspective as tools. They are tools just as the pencil and the farm hole are tools. One of the things that the revolution must do is change the pattern of life of the people waging the struggle. In this context, Frelimo was like a farmer planting seeds, nurturing and transplanting these seeds in order to produce stronger trees, which will be the foundation of the new society. At the Infantario Josina Machel, a human transplant is taking place. A Frelimo responsible describes this process. Josina Machel was the head of the social welfare in Frelimo, that uh, we still see her as a person that we can learn from, an example of her life. And uh, especially for children, for whom she had fought for many times to see that children can be taken care of, they can have a better life, they can live without having to face many difficulties, and they can live in a Frelimo environment so that they can continue the struggle that we had started people here decided to give the name of this nursery to Josina Machel. It's very important and it's very significant for us. Before, in the colonial era, in these regions where Frelimo, uh, are liberated by Frelimo, we did not think of having a nursery for our people. A nursery in uh, the colonial uh, dominated areas is being used only for children of rich people, whilst uh, among ourselves the nursery is a place where we can take care of the children of our militants so because they are busy fulfilling other missions somewhere where they cannot sit with their children. Frelimo has to take care of them. Or also of children of people that are died because of the war, either by bomb or in a combat. And also we use our nursery uh, to take care of children that come from the zones which are still under the Portuguese control. Let's say children that we liberate from the Portuguese concentration camps. So this is the place where we bring all these children together and we educate them in a way to understand what Frelimo is and what they are in our struggle and what Frelimo expects from them. And we consider, because of that, this as uh, something like uh, viveiro. But it's a place where we plant the seeds that uh, later on are going to be transplanted into big chambers or big fields so that they can uh, produce whatever we need, whether rice or cabbage or things like that. So this is the place where we consider it uh, as an analogy with uh, a viveiro, where we have our children and we, in our environment we can teach them all the meanings of the life uh, in the friendly environment and also where we can teach them what Freddy expects from them, what is their role, because as Comrade uh, Samora, our president, said, uh, we are fighting now, we are going to get old, are going to die, the children that we can see here are going to continue the struggle that we started. They are the real continuadores, and because of that, they have to assume all the traditions, all the aspirations of our people to fight Portuguese colonialism and imperialism.
one of the political slogans of the people in Mozambique is to die a tribe and be born a nation. The guerrilla army is completely integrated. It is composed of people from all nine provinces of Mozambique and all of the different tribes. As the guerrilla army moves throughout the country, it carries songs and dances from all of the tribes and all of the regions. All of these songs and dances have a political message added by the people. Wherever the army travels, the people learn the various songs and dances brought from other regions. Frelimo says that none of these songs and none of these dances belong to any one tribe or to any one region. They are part of the national culture and part of the national heritage. The guerrilla army makes this a living concept as it transplants the culture of the people of Mozambique throughout the country. The struggle to free Mozambique is being waged by people. People who have overcome many obstacles and who face many more. However, no march is too long for them, nor is any other task too difficult. In the words of Samora Machel, Frelimo's president, when we march, we feel stimulated and content because during the march, we learn about ourselves and we resolve any individual problems. During the march, we perspire as a group, and each drop of sweat fertilizes our soil and consolidates our unity. We do not have airplanes or cars, but we have something else, the numerous mobile, or two legs. The cannon, mortars, mines, and grenades which destroy the enemy are all transported by the numerous mobile. Here we can measure the importance of mankind. Man is strong, stronger than an elephant, stronger than a car, Man is the decisive factor in a war of national liberation. Viva Frelimo! Viva Frelimo! Viva! 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 Viva!